So yeah, welcome to Advanced Assessments and Planning. Um, and really, a lot of the time when I do these, I've got a whole series of ABCs of Anesthesia kind of boot camp series of videos, but really what I want to do with this one is to, uh, this, this is really like a concept lecture, like a lot of things that I feel I wish I knew back in the day. Um, I'm, I'm trying to make it into kind of a lecture series that actually really works for people to try and upskill up what they already know. Um, the, look, this this course, so essentially the, these lecture series and all the ABCs of anesthesia bootcamp stuff goes on this foundations course. Um, and that's where I'm just going to keep uploading all the kind of introductory training level and slightly advanced stuff uh, onto that. Um, it's a whole kind of management system, learning management system, and hopefully it will kind of replace what I think introductory training should be. So let's get on to it. anesthesia assessments and planning. So really, my objectives are: look, I, I want to cover all of the basics in a in a in a very checklistable way. But after that, after that basic level, um, there's there's this next layer which is kind of exponentially more complicated because each question you ask in your basic as anesthetic assessment can result in the answer that now you need to have a whole bunch of other elements of knowledge. Now, what I what I think these are all just re really algorithms and knowing where to find these resources. So hopefully what I'm going to give you is a taste of where to go and how to, you know, how to solve these problems that you might find. So yeah, I really just want to simplify all of these next level problems in your anesthesia history taking with um, yeah, algorithms and principles. And, and just remember, especially because you guys are, are at a level where you're either just started anesthetic training or you're about to get onto training, the thing that you do day in, day out is take histories and like literally, and, and, and anesthetists do not care whether you intubate someone and are successful or the LMA is successful. And even if you fail a drip, we, we honestly don't care. If you get in there and you've done a really good assessment on your patients, um, if you present a plan, if you do that in a thorough way, that's the thing that we really care about. So this lecture right here is probably the most important set of lectures aside, yeah, aside from, you know, just don't be a dick at work, you know, being, being a nice person. So um, I would say that as, as, as uh, kind of theoretical that this might be, I'd say this is far more important than the airway lecture, which, you know, everyone comes to next year. Um, it, I'd, I'd say this is far more important than that. So I'll also give you lots of resources and access to resources. And really, this is about, you know, growth into advanced practice. I don't think it's complicated stuff. Again, you know your resources, you know the algorithms. You'll end up remembering this stuff just from the sheer volume of practice that you do. Um, yeah, hopefully you impress your bosses, you get a good reference. And and also in interviews, this is, you know, eminently examinable in that as well. <clears throat> so here's going to be the range of topics. So we will very quickly go through the standard assessment, which will take two seconds. We'll talk about previous bad reactions. We'll talk about family history, PONV, post over nausea and vomiting, that is, allergies, exercise tolerance, aspiration risk, and then obstetric assessments, PEDS assessments. And then we'll go through a few unique things, which are like math, masses, essentially thyroid, malignancies, masses for, uh, affecting critical structures. And then a few medical, uh, very, you know, very subtle medical problems that are very anesthetically relevant. There's obviously more than this, but these are essentially the extension to standard assessment and then a frameworks for interesting medical problems. Now, again, I really keep this informal. And this is this this to me is um so much a concept lecture. This is literally the first time I'm giving it. If anyone wants, you know, anyone has any questions or wants to go into something in more detail, I've got time. Okay. So please ask me because that will really help me to refine this lecture for next time. So just don't be shy about doing that at all. Oh, yeah, and pacemakers as well. So the basic assessment. Now, again, I'm going to give you all of this uh, in your workbook to follow. But like what, what you notice about this basic assessment is that it's you know it's actually quite easy. Like if you use this form or somewhere similar, like a checklist. Um, I remember the Alfred pre-anesthetic assessment form was like very much like a checklist, and I I still I feel like I still have that in my mind as the way I often do a history. Um, for, from, for the patient because it was just these tick box things that I could follow very easily, even as a junior. So if you can do this, you almost get to basic trainee level just because you're asking the questions. Like my confidence in you is not that you have a lot of depth of knowledge, but you don't miss anything. Like if you do an assessment and you know all about how to assess this patient's heart failure, that's great. But if you don't ask about PONV or you don't ask about you know previous airway problems, or if you don't ask about family history of issues, that's a real problem for me as a consultant. I can't trust that you covered everything. Whereas if you say yes, 
there's heart failure and you, you don't ask much more about that, it's flagged to me as a consultant that I would need to ask about it again. Obviously, it's great if you go through everything, but I'd rather at an introductory stage, even at an advanced level, I want you to go through the breadth of everything because that gives me trust that you've asked the question. So again, use these forms. It's a checklist. Just have it on your phone uh, as you're talking to the, you know, as you're talking to your patient, and it makes it so much easier. So, like, here's literally what I ask: um, Have you had any problems with previous anesthetics or surgery? Any nausea, vomiting? Uh, any family members with issues? Uh, are you on any medications? And then I can, you know, usually. So I usually ask the medications question first because that gives me it's kind of the cheat to screen all the medical conditions that may, that they may have. And I don't know if you ever got to this thing where you say, do you have any heart problems? And they go, no. And then you look at the medications and they're on, you know, Fruzamide, Espronolactone and Bisoprolol. And you say, oh, well, how about this? And they, oh, no, I, I had many heart attacks, but I've been treated for it. So I don't have them anymore. So anyway, the medications question is often my screening tool. Allergies secondary to that. And then I get to straight away to, you know, heart or breathing problems and any other medical conditions. Um, often I'll ask, can you walk up two flights of stairs without stopping? That's my exercise tolerance question, obviously. And then when was the last time you ate or drank anything and getting the details of that? Um, do you get reflux or heartburn? And then I perform an airway exam, auscultate the chest and do a dental exam every single time. So now, and then note any relevant investigations. Now, most of the time, all your answers are gonna be absolutely fair, favorable. Um, and, you know, I, I had a case ju ju just yesterday, which is the standard case, a gynae case where, you know, no allergies, no problems at all. And then I know that my anesthetic plan is going to be pretty straightforward. You know, it's a GA versus, you know, regional local. It's an LMA versus ETT with paralysis, standard monitoring, very normal analgesics, antimedics, antibiotics, DVT prophylaxis wasn't needed. And then they just go straight home. So that is a right, question. And that's my planning system. But now let's go through when it isn't actually uh, going to be you know, favorable, when you get a positive result on your questions. So let's go through these. And um, this is where I'm going to try to get you guys involved as well, because I, I'm a big fan of this. This is not just a didactic lecture. I really want you to test your knowledge, test your logic. Um, even if you haven't done this before, it's absolutely fine. And I will ask, ask people for their, for their answers as well. So previous bad reaction. Now, um, I might ask uh, Calvin, what kind of previous bad reactions, minor and major, have you heard about? I absolutely agree. Often, and, and you said some extra stuff, which is absolutely correct. Often the stuff I hear is I was slow to wake up. And, you know, often that means nothing to me. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's so anecdotal. I have no concept of it. Mild pain, nausea, absolutely fine. And we'll go through that later. But yeah, major stuff like cardiac arrest, difficult airways, these are things I really take seriously. And what do you do? I think you already mentioned it, uh, that you really just have to look for that letter, chase that medical history and look for, you know, ICU and anesthetic notes. And these days with EMRs, it's it's just so much easier to kind of get that information. But often in private hospitals, they haven't really sorted out their EMRs yet. So it often takes a phone call. And if it's not an, you know, I'll, I'll show you what to do if you have no time to get a history. So you have no time to get that letter or find that history, but often you have time, you can get that record and I can hopefully, you know, send Kelvin off to do it. So I don't have to you know, bother with that phone call. Thanks, Kelvin. Um, the joys of being a consultant. Now, occasionally what we said was as well, occasionally the patient doesn't know and they say something like, I almost died. Or I can't have an anesthetic ever again. And it's one of those funny things how you know, something trivial may have happened in the operation, but then sometimes someone outside who's heard of something that happened exaggerates in the big deal. And I don't know whether they just want to create a bit of drama because it's interesting or, you know, make the patient feel better because they survived something trivial. I don't know, but often this results in absolutely nothing, but I can't be certain about that. So what, you know, what do you ask? to decide whether that statement is serious or not. You search for any kind of past history, let's say it's not available. I often ask if they stayed in ICU. As soon as they stayed in ICU afterwards, that's a big red flag because almost everyone that gets chest compressions or any level of badness will stay in HDU ICU afterwards or, or maybe the ward. Uh, did they see a specialist after that as well? Um, and, and, and actually, Nick, the other, other stuff you said is absolutely relevant. Like, did they have an anesthetic after that is a really great question, which I haven't put there, because, you know, 
you know, essentially they've survived. They've had a, a test dose of the next anesthetic without without event. So that's great. Now, let's say if this patient genuinely had a cardiac arrest, what do you what do you do then with that information? And this might be a, kind of an obvious thing, uh, but let's say they absolutely have to go ahead with the surgery. Um, what do you do if you know the patient had a cardiac arrest and you don't know many details about it? So you're going to do a full assessment to check out what actually causes. Seems so logical. Um, and let's say, okay, good, good. Uh, so you've done your assessment. You assess it. You figure out the cause of it. Let's say you don't have much idea of the cause of it. You wanted extra hands. Absolutely. So you get assistance. I've got this kind of format, monitoring assistance, drugs, equipment. Um, would you, what kind of extra monitoring would you have? I guess you'd have like in, in addition to your blood pressure sats and um, mm -hmm. an ECG, yeah. you might want like a, an art line in, you might want a central line in. Um, in case you, yeah. That's perfect. So monitoring you up, up, upscale that often it's, it's almost always going to be an art line for this case if they had a previous cardiac arrest and maybe a central line, depending on what the cause is. Now you talked about, so monitoring M, A assistance. So you get other hands. You might want it like literally just an extra anesthetic nurse and an extra registrar or consultant. Now the drugs thing is really a cardiac induction. You do this kind of very specific type of induction. I've got that in my critical inductions uh, video on YouTube as well as in the course. Um, but it's a very specific kind of induction that doesn't allow too much blood pressure and contractility changes. Um, and then equipment. So because they had a cardiac arrest, I like that you went, well, how do I fix a cardiac arrest? It's essentially, I need to defibrillate this patient if, if, if something like that happened. Again, I'd have all of these things ready just in case. So, and, and as you mentioned, IC on site. So full cardiac assessment context, and that means everything, you know, um, history, examination, investigations, check if they've had an echo recently, angio, stress tests, all of that stuff. You need to get a really good idea of what this heart's doing. And then based on that, you would do a very careful induction, art line, defib, ICU, CCU post-operatively. What happens if the, the letter or the information told you that this patient has a really difficult airway? Um, you may not, some people know these terms, but they've got a Cormac Lehane laryngoscopy grade four uh, with a difficult bag mask and difficult LMA. Um, what, what's your option if you know that? Literally, the, the, the one word answer to this is I would do an awake fiber optic and everything else that you do is absolutely right. So when someone has a difficult airway, it's actually never a problem, like an impossible to manage airway because of a grade four view and impossible LMA and impossible bag mass happens very rarely. But when it does, they come to you as a, you know, as a junior, obviously you won't have the skills yet to do all this, but by the time you become a consultant, literally the answer is awake fiber optic intubation, but everything else is there as well. You've got an extra person there. You've got um, all of your other air equipment because the weight fiber optics can fail as well, even though they really shouldn't. This is the bad react. The worst bad reactions are cardiac arrest and difficult airways often. Uh, and um, this is this is literally the method that you want to you want to go about treating that. And, and, here, just yeah. one thing for the awake fiber optics. So what's your what do you tend to do when you have the patient who's delirious or has dementia or well clearly is not going to buy into an awake fiber optic? And I know this is a very broad question, but what would your yeah. plan B be in that case? That is a terrible situation. Now, there's um there's lots of ways that you can control someone uh, who's who's um not well. So for example, if someone's non-compliant, obviously I'm trying to keep them spont venting plus, uh, you know, put this tube down. And there's many ways you could do that. So what I'm thinking is the, the, the safest ways to keep them spont venting would be some level of chemical sedation like droperidol or ketamine. So droperidol at decent doses is fantastic for just locking people in without movement. Now it's something that the ED, ED people are really, really good with. And, you know, I think we've got a couple of maybe some ED trainees here. If they've done that with droperidol, I'd love to hear from them, but also using ketamine can be fantastic to help buy you time. Trust me, this is never ideal and you just don't want it to happen. Uh, and then you try to go ahead with it as best as possible. You'd always have someone, because this can go horribly wrong very quickly. I'd always have a surgical airway kit there as I'm doing the, the weight fiber optic technique. But I'd say this is just one of the hardest things ever. And luckily the Venn diagram of non-compliance plus impossible airway management rarely ever combines. So I'd, I'd say it may never happen to you in your career, but if it does, that's the way I'd approach it. Sometimes you have a problematic family history. So I'm gonna get people just to write down 30 seconds if a, if, a, 
if um, your patient tells you a family member had some bad allergic reaction, or they the family member had bad POND, post-operative nausea vomiting, or you know person had a you know cut family member had a cardiac arrest, or family member had some rare things. What firstly, what would you do for those first three, and what are the rare family bad reaction can inherited conditions that you can get uh, what would you do if the family member had a bad allergic reaction what does that mean for this family member um so often you know they come in and they say i don't want to take penicillin because my mum's allergic yep. <laughs> anyway and so what, and um, what do you do <laughs> um i guess try to re-educate them um hmm. because that does limit you know your treatment in the future obviously um so you, you'd crack on yeah like there's no there's no problem with a previous a family member having allergies no not allergies I guess like rare stuff like we'll come to later which I'd be concerned about so like sucks apnea or malignant hypothermia perfect how about um, look, and you're absolutely right those are the rare things how about a family member having post-operative nausea vomiting um, I mean, I don't think there's any like inherited, like Perfect. increased risk, um, you know, like if they're also a young female that doesn't smoke and also gets motion sickness, maybe, you know, like that's, you know, it's just all independent factors. So um, the cardiac arrest, I guess, like I'd probably want to drill down into like why this family member had a cardiac arrest. Um, obviously, there's like some increased risk, like genetically, if you, you know, have really strong you know, family history of, um, you know, um, acute coronary syndrome. So I'm trying to drill that down really. So let's um, say that that's absolutely right. So let's say someone uh, has an elderly father who had a cardiac arrest, but they're like in their thirties. That sounds like what you're saying is that's not a risk now, but you know, they're obviously going to have some level of increased risk maybe if they're. Yeah. Was well, a- maybe like if that, that, you know, grandfather also had a, you know, an AMI at 28 or something, then I would be like maybe exactly. slightly more worried. But like, you know, if he like, you know, had a cardiac arrest on induction at 87, I probably wouldn't be as worried. Like, exactly. I mean, obviously terrible situation, but not not yeah. as worried. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, so when would it be absolutely a problem or potentially a problem if a family member had a cardiac arrest and it like, it, it's, let's say it was an acute coronary syndrome as a pathology, what things could be inherited? that might cause a problem let's say you've got some kind of prolonged qt hockham or other inherited problem as soon as i do the history and say why did you have a cardiac arrest which you which you said if they said oh look elderly patient had a massive bleed had a you know something else going on had an ami great i don't have to be too concerned as long as soon as they say oh yeah i've got a funny rhythm in my heart my dad's got a pacemaker for this other thing or yeah we heard about this hypertrophic something something yeah (laughs) i'm a bit worried now and i i pause and i i stop yeah um, so, I mean, obviously this is, again, you get a positive result for any of these. Some of them don't matter. Others do matter. And then you report this to your boss and hopefully you've done a nice thorough history. It's very unusual to have someone who had malignant hypothermia in the family or sucks apnea. But, you know, I've, I've, I've seen it maybe three times in my career now of 14 years. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that common, but you don't want to miss it if it does. So let's, let's talk about sucks apnea. Beautiful. And to get, give you a the detail, there's inherited and acquired pseudocholinesterase deficiency. And in the really prolonged one, it's uh, the inherited condition. And you just get these you know, alterations and you can get heterozygous or homozygous mutations. Heterozygous mutations are pretty common, like one in 20, 25. And it, you, you know, sucks can then last instead of five minutes, last about 10 minutes, which again is, remember, that's significant. If, if you used to hear about people using succinamethonium as their relaxant of choice if there was a difficult airway because of this thing that oh well the patient will breathe and you've got you know you've got five minutes to get the airway then they breathe and you're all good but that's just fraught with pro- you know probability problems there um, as well as the fact that you've still got propofol on board um, if you have a homozygous mutation it could last hours and essentially if that's the case your patient needs to go ventilate to icu so yeah if, if it is sucks apnea this is not the biggest problem You really just need to confirm that that it is the case or send for testing. And if it is, it's actually quite simple to progress with this. Um, um, Does anyone know what you would do for the case if someone had sucks apnea besides avoiding sucks? Like what would you do for muscle relaxation? And so let's say the indications for sucks are going to be, I want a fast acting agent 
or a short acting agent. So how do I solve that problem of fast acting agent? And how do I solve the problem of needing a short acting agent? Rock uranium at 1.2 milligrams per kilogram instead of the normal 0.6 milligrams per kilogram means that you get an onset that one study showed that is actually faster than succinethonium. So, you know, like, you know, trivially faster, but that means that you do have a replacement for that. Now, the, the problem is when you give 1.2 milligrams per kilogram of succinethonium, it will, uh, sorry, rock uranium, it will definitely last a very long time. And someone in the chat has said, what can you do to have a shorter duration of stuff? You can give Sugamidex. What agents uh, are susceptible to Sugamidex? Um, so VEC and rock, uh, rock. Absolutely. So if you want a really short acting agent, uh, you can get, you know, you can just give a smaller dose of stuff uh, in general, but the very elegant way of doing this would be to give a dose of vecuronium or rock uranium for whatever, whatever dose you need and make sure you measure the muscle twitches and then you give Sugamidex at the appropriate dose. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's how you make it shorter. Uh, some people would use Mivacurium, which is a like a, a kind of lesser known of the non depolarizing muscle relaxants. But um, yeah, it, it's just a very short acting muscle relaxant. Um, not as definitive as using just Sugam uh, rock and Sugamidex. Yep, so there's always a suck substitute do you use sucks much at all anymore? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I use sucks just as much as I use rock uranium for rapid sequence inductions. Um, I like the fact that it's, I, I think I'm just really familiar with it, but actually, so just yesterday, I had a case of a BMI 60 patient who's a gynae list with rapid turnover and and it was just small procedures as well. And I was like, okay, I need, a, I need to get intubating conditions quickly in this patient because there'll be a difficult bag mask. So I had to use either sucks or rock uranium, but, this, the, but the procedure itself is gonna be about 20 minutes. And so rock uranium at that dose might last you know, an hour or more. So literally I thought, yeah, well, sucks is the right drug for this. So I often use sucks for rapid sequences. Um, and for ECT, ECT, you just need a fast acting agent that's short lived and it's very cumbersome using 1.2 milligrams per kilogram rock uranium and massive doses of Sugamidex. So SUX is kind of the, just the, the most elegant drug for that. But yeah, I, I use SUX all the time. So malignant hyperthermia, again, once you know the patient is at risk or, you know, it's confirmed or, or uh, you know, a, a potential malignant hyperthermia patient, there's this whole organization, which is essentially, I think is dis malignant hyperthermia is discovered in Australia and the testing is very local. It's at, you know, Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Society Melding the Hypothermia, Australia, New Zealand, they kind of run all this stuff and run great things. So this is one of those things that, uh, you know, bosses love to talk about, eminently examinable. You'll see it in your sim sessions. Um, you know, they've got this whole crisis resource management type thing going. I really encourage you to look at this website, check, look at the resource kit and the cards, um, which is all... Whoop which is all available at this website. I'll give you a QR code later, but all of it has kind of logical things. So um, if someone wants to just volunteer, just quickly, what is malignant hypothermia in a sentence and how, how uh, what agents trigger malignant hypothermia is the first two questions. So you want to avoid one of the muscle relaxant sucks and you want to avoid all the volatiles. Nitrous oxide is completely fine. So it's very, very specific. And yeah, you're right. It's a hypermetabolic condition. You get just uncontrolled muscle contraction causing hypermetabolism, very high temperatures. Um, and really the mortality was 40 to 50% before the discovery of this drug called dantrolene, which uncouples this receptor. But interestingly enough, you can't solve this muscle contraction with um, a non-depolarizing muscle blocker because the contraction happens in the ryanodine receptor, not um, before the nicotinic receptor. So that's just one of those kind of peculiar things about it. So essentially you get a case that might be susceptible. You've got to prepare your theater um, and do stuff pr uh, pr before and in the operation. What do you reckon you do to prepare? So I would go to the kit and I would never rely on my memory for this because it's got, it'll have a checklist, but literally you want no volatile or sucks to be in the system. So what would you do to get rid of any residual stuff? you flush the circuit and there's a whole guideline in the document I'm going to show you that shows what level of flow you need. But essentially what we do is 15 liters per minute. And we just let that go in early, early in the morning to make sure there's nothing left. And it may be 30 minutes. It might be 90 minutes. It might even be more than that depends on your machine and the complexity of the machine, but anything else that we can do, we change like someone said in the chat, very good. Remove your vaporizer. So take the SIVO straight off, 
replace the soda lime canister with a fresh one, replace the circuit because they're often disposable or they're recyclable or reusable, bags, tubes, even you can add these charcoal filters onto the circuit just to be sure. So this whole policy document, I don't care that you memorize it. I mean, it's pretty logical, but you just need to know that that exists and know where to find it. Um, intraoperatively, again, it's pretty logical. You avoid volatiles and sucks. That's easy enough. Um, if you if you can't use volatiles, you use any of the intravenous agents. Usually, propofol is what you'll use, and any muscle relaxant that's not sucks. High, generally, would you know, normally we run like two liters, you know, one to two liters per minute of oxygen flow. You probably want to go higher just to stop any residual volatile occurring, and you probably want to have this patient first on the list after you flush the circuit. Um, overnight, just to make sure that there's nothing else uh, from a previous patient um, or use of volatile. Okay, just um, there, there's a QR kit for the MH resource kit. Feel free to take a photo of it now, um, but also it will be in the workbooks that I send you guys. So what do you do if your patient uh, reported that they had nausea or vomiting? So maybe in your workbooks, just write a few questions that you'd want to ask this patient. That's fantastic. It's such an important question. The I want to know the context. You're absolutely right. I want to know the context, the surgery, and other risk factors to see what the baseline level of risk was anyway. Um, and then I want to go, yeah, how bad was the vomiting? Like, how bad was it for you? And how long did it last for? And what did they do previously? They might not have all this information, but you know, I reckon that question of duration and how bad they felt is is really telling. So, you know, the difference between having a day of vomiting and nausea for a patient and for the logistics of having someone stay overnight is incredibly different. I mean, it, it, it means that they can't have their operation in a day procedure center, essentially. They get it done in a, in a major center sometimes. Um, so it absolutely not trivial. You will get this as a positive response to your, uh, uh, to your history taking often. So please remember these points because this is exactly what your consult consultant wants to hear. Now, Again, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this in your workbooks, but this is the document that every anesthetist knows. So the fourth consensus guidelines for the management of POV. This came out recently, so 2020. It's just the best document for, you know, this is this is essentially one page of this massive document and it tells you everything you need to know. There's also a pediatric one will be less relevant to you at this point. So, you know, literally you check, check these very specific risk factors and note that, you know, family member having, um, nausea vomiting isn't one of the risk factors, then you do these. These are the only things you can really do to risk mitigate, evidence-based. And then it's literally everyone gets two agents based on this guideline, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and if there's greater than two risk factors, give three to four agents. Um, so yeah, this is just a, this is the document that should be on your trolleys even, uh, which I think it used to be on our trolleys at our public hospital. Uh, just to be able to, you know, not under manage it. You'll you'll see lots of consultants still kind of old school. They haven't gone, they haven't seen this document. They haven't adopted it. They often just give one antiemetic, but, you know, literally I just drop, you know, dexamethasone and droperidol for every case and just give that. Uh, what's your reason for choosing droperidol as opposed to something like undansetron? Yeah, so I, I've got to say it, it probably doesn't matter too much. Um, I... I I remember reading somewhere or learning that Andansetron was better for getting rid of nausea once it had already started than droperidol. And I don't have, I probably don't have good evidence for that. If you were to give Dexon Dansetron, completely fine. And, you know, no one would, no one would just say anything different for it. They're both very, you know, very safe, very good, great number needed to treat of like there's, um, what is it? Uh, dexamethasone, droperidol. I think cyclozine as well as ondansetron have a number near to treat of five, which is incredibly effective when you think of, you know, all the other stuff we do with far less good number near to treat. Um, there was this black box warning about droperidol where someone had, you know, Q QT issues. And I think there may have been a death. This was a long time ago, um, but that was from high dose droperidol. I think it was greater than 25 milligrams. So just know that 0. 0.625 milligrams has minimal or less effect than on ondansetron on your QT interval. People from kind of my generation of practice still have this feeling of oh, droperidol, it's a bit scary to use, but at those doses, it, it evidence-based, really not a problem. I was going to ask, um, yeah. you leave DEX for the recovery, for recovery, is that right? Or... Oh, de oh, definitely not. Dexamethasone always when the patient's asleep. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> I was gonna say, have, have you heard of anyone saying, yeah. <laughs> 
the side effect, but no, that's good to yeah. know. Yeah. Well, we can say it. We're medical. It's, so if <laughs> everyone's given droperidol, someone who's awake at a certain yeah. rate, perianal burning at an intense level is a real thing. Um, yeah, if, not, not, not that you should try this, but I've accidentally given droperidol quite quickly once the patient is asleep. And as soon as I've given it a few, you know, a few seconds later, you get this massive tachycardia um, before, uh, you know, before anything is ever even done. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a thing. So what happens if someone says I'm allergic to penicillin? Um, does anyone have an approach for that at this point? You know, what happened was the reaction. Um, how long ago was this is often a thing like, if, you know, what is it about time? I think the previous formulations used to be different. So there's this kind of rate, uh, according to this calculator, which was a massive study, it, the length of t time also affects whether they're truly penicillin allergic or not. What was the treatment is often really important. You know, if they had adrenaline, great, I'm going to take this seriously. If they had antihistamines, probably not. Um, yeah, and then everything you were talking about there, have you ever received Keflex or Keflosporins? Go your GP for antibiotics. I just want to know what, if they had, often they've been given Augmentin and that's, you know, for, that's like the, the GP drug for every anti antibiotic related thing. And you quickly know, great, this wasn't a problem. Um, this MDCal PenFast uh, questionnaire, that just gives you a rate of probability, but often my decision-making is actually based on this. So most penicillin allergies are mild. The cross-reactivity KEF is, is, you know, it's thought to be 10%, but there's a, a suggestion that it's probably overestimating it. And test doses are just not useful. Has anyone had their consultant do a test dose in the past? I think uh, most of my consultants have, have gotten me to do test doses for Kefzol and, and all that, usually Kefzol. And, but, um, and what do you think of that? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 I can, uh, we had um, the anaphylaxis, anesthetics anaphylaxis guy tell us it wasn't useful a few weeks ago, but I've still seen it <laughs> used quite a bit. Um, I yeah. suppose it's useful in some ways it, if you give Kefzol slowly to an awake patient, but not for the reasons of allergy is what I'd say, more, more for nausea. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with you. So, I mean, when you think of, there's a couple of myths about anaphylaxis that is really important to clarify. There's this talk of the first thing is that testers aren't useful just because it's so even in that one mil or whatever fraction you give. So, you know, up to 100 uh, milligrams of kefazolin, that's still a massive dose of kefazolin that can cause an anaphylactic reaction. So the testers kind of protocols are far smaller doses and a far longer time frame. Now, the other thing people say as a reply to this of not, not using testos is, oh, well, anaphylaxis is an all or nothing reaction, but it's, it's not in the way you think it is. For example, when you do skin testing for allergies, you still do a skin wheel of a, of a substance and that will cause a reaction, but that doesn't cause anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is not all or nothing, like that little skin prick isn't going to suddenly cause a cascade that causes your whole body to have anaphylaxis. So it does have a certain level of dose dependency and test doses like skin testing is a very small dose of that. Um, that said, test doses in the right time frame with the right amount are just not useful. So if, if I'm going to give it, I, I often give it before or just after induction, I just give it at a, at a slow push and you know I'm not too worried about that. Now, if there was any suspicion of anaphylaxis, don't even be concerned about what you can, you know, what alternative you can use, just go straight to the next agent, which is either therapy guidelines recommends clindamycin or vancomycin. If they're, you know, you're worried about MRSA, if you delay antibiotics by trying to decide what to do and make, you know, asking a ton more questions, that's, that's just not useful because you're delaying antibiotics, which, you know, needs to be given a certain time frame pre-incision to prevent uh, surgical site infections. Now, if it's not a serious reaction, most of us would give kefazolin, I'd, I'd say, just because of the fact that most reactions don't translate, the cross reactivity is a lot less, and a mild reaction to penicillin or a very distant reaction that was mild to penicillin just won't cause a problem. Okay, how about opioids? So anaphylaxis is incredibly rare, but what happens you know, if someone has severe nausea vomiting to, say, morphine? Like, how do you approach opioids? Um, might ask someone else. Uh, hey, actually, someone can volunteer. What do they give to someone if they had a serious nausea vomiting to morphine? There's definitely going to be a, some level of cross reactivity, but you have to give something most of the time for you know surgical patients some level of opioid. And you know, often you know, uh, so either avoid opioids, 
give a different opioid is the more practical thing. And I often try small doses, even when they're in the pre-anesthetic bay, just to see the effect of a quick dose of fentanyl, 25 mics, for example. And then mm. if they are truly nor have nausea and severe nausea to everything, then it's pretty tricky. I've got to try a whole multimodal approach with ketamine and a whole bunch of other agents. But then also I have a very um, frank conversation with the patient. Look, you know, you, we, we don't have all the, we don't have the most ideal drugs in the world, medications for pain that don't give nausea. So you'll have to tread the balance between, are you, are you, do you prefer pain or do you prefer nausea? And I've definitely had patients in the past saying, look, my pain tolerance is great. Um, I, and I give them options like endone and things to go home with, but they often just go, you know, I'd rather sort of deal with the pain than the extreme nausea I get. But you're absolutely right. I can't, generally I can't avoid opioids altogether, especially with discharge meds. Um, yeah. And you know, ket running ketamine isn't, isn't useful uh, at home, obviously. And I just try a different opioid. And often there is just no cross-reactivity in my experience. You, you could always try and get them into a regional clinic and avoid opioids altogether, but I don't think it was that practical. Yeah, so some operations, absolutely. I've definitely done like a, a nerve catheter technique in someone who's going to stay at home for a bit longer, uh, for, you know, like an ankle or, you know, peripheral operation. Mm -hmm. But once they need to go home, if there's a day procedure, it's just not practical. And maybe, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it's one of those things where there's such bad nausea and such potentially bad pain that you definitely have to run them on regional for a few days. But that's a, yeah, that's a complex conversation. So that's common things, penicillin, Allergy and opioid nausea are very common. And this extra little thing which we had in one of our meetings recently was known anaphylaxis with an unknown agent. So imagine the patient came in for a procedure and they had a severe anaphylaxis reaction, needing everything, adrenaline, maybe even CPR, but the procedure is urgent. So it was canceled. And now they're coming back within a week. Now, the thing with allergy testing is, first of all, it's hard to get a booking because you know, they're, they're flooded with these tests, need for testing, but you've got to wait six weeks for your mast cells to replenish their histamine before you can actually do the skin testing again. So you've got this real conundrum. Patient needs surgery. They've had anaphylaxis. They almost died. And now I need to do a case. So what on earth do we do? Now, I want you to guys to write something down. Like literally an anesthetic is based on giving sleepy stuff, paralyzing stuff, analgesic stuff, and maybe a few other peripheral things like antibiotics, anti-emetics, DVT prophylaxis, inotropes. That's probably the kind of the range of medications that we're co commonly giving. What would you do if you needed to crack on and you know they just almost died the, the last week? How would you do anesthetic? For sleepy stuff, so I'm going to replace everything that is a common allergen is kind of the, the summary of this. Um, and the best agents to give, you, you guys were absolutely right. So propofol has an anaphylaxis rate of you know, roughly one in 60,000, uh, thiopentanone one in 10,000. So profile, I'll just give as I normally give it. It's not a problem. The fact that it's a high potensive agent is just not a problem in this early thing because we're not going to cause anaphylaxis with that. Um, maybe once I start giving the muscle relaxants, if I really need to, then I might have to, you know, just watch my monitors, have an art line and, and treat as necessary. Volatiles don't cause anaphylaxis either. Opioids, again, are very, very safe. And I like the approach that whatever they gave last time, I could give a different one this time. I might just preface that with, again, fentanyl has a very low anaphylaxis rate and minimal histamine release. So it would be very safe to give that even if they had anaphylaxis last time. It's just not likely to be the trigger. Now, the, the muscle relaxant is the trickiest decision. Does some surgeries absolutely need muscle paralysis, um, but others need a relative muscle paralysis. So Absolutely, vacuum has been shown to have a low anaphylaxis risk, even though it's kind of related aminosteroid-wise, it's the same st similar structures to rocuarium, but low anaphylaxis, whereas rocuarium and sucks are very high. Atracurium's moderate level. Cisatracurium is incredibly low anaphylaxis rate as well. So one of those two agents, absolutely what I'd use. If I wanted to avoid muscle relaxants completely, I could just give remifentanil at a low, you know, infusion rate of 0.05 to 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, and also just turn up my volatile. Volatile has a weak muscle relaxant activity, whereas propofol infusions don't. So that's kind of what I do if I, if I really need to avoid all muscle relaxants. Um, I'd avoid kefazolin, so give clindamycin instead. Um, vancomycin is a high kind of histamine release effect, so I don't want to murky the waters there. 
I would always avoid chlorhexidine. Again, one of the mass, biggest triggers for anaphylaxis is chlorhexidine. All your antimedics are generally safe and your inotropes obviously very safe. So that's kind of my plan. You know, this, this is not ideal, but this is kind of what you have to do in these situations when you can't get testing. Oh, can I ask, is there a particular volatile that you would choose? Uh, yep, just the one I always use, which is sevoflurane. But yeah, none yep. of them have any other kind of anaphylaxis problems. Now, so the next phase is, so we've gone through, we're just at the end of all the standard questions. So how fit is your patient? Um, now, why is this such an important thing? Well, fitness correlates very well with perioperative survival. And there's this magic number of four METs or metabolic equivalents um, where if the patient, so in the studies that they've done, and these are like really large trials or, or case series where they've done, I think, tens of thousands of patients and the patients that have greater than four METs have better perioperative survival than those with less than four METs. This kind of makes sense. So like everyone's saying, the surgery is a stress on the body and it's almost like if the, you know, if the body can't mobilize heart and lung resources to distribute blood and nutrients and tissue healing factors, uh, because that's what it takes to heal the body, then you're going to get your wound breakdowns, your infections and all that kind of stuff. So the, the questions we ask are this thing, you know, there's two flights of stairs or four blocks. So that's not strictly met, but the study that's quoted in this particular article talks about if patients could... Um, do two flights of stairs. And I think it was very specific amounts, like six inches per step, 20 steps per flight. And the four blocks had a particular distance. If they could do that without stopping, they did better. If you're in pre-admission clinic and you're wondering about this and the patient, you know, you're not really sure, you know how far the car park was and whether they came in on a wheelchair. And if you do have a set of stairs, you could just walk the patient up there and go, hey, let's see if you can actually do it. Really practical way of trying to figure out whether the, this patient's fit or not. Now, the, probably the more sci scientific way of doing this is, so this QR code will take you straight to um, the DASI score. Um, so the Duke Activity Status Index, you can fill out this, a bit of a questionnaire and um, yeah, literally figure out what this patient can do. Now, before the DASI, I used to just go, can you walk up a flight of stairs? How far can you walk? And if they couldn't do that, I'd just get an idea of activity. So, you know, are they cleaning around the house? Are they mowing the lawn? Are they doing gardening? Like you, you want to report back to your bosses with some level of information so that they can, you know, ascertain that you're firstly trying to figure that out, but also if the, is this patient safe for an elective operation? Um, the, the strict definition of metabolic equivalent, it's the amount of oxygen required for a person at rest uh, that's one met, so just to survive. And roughly that's 3.5 mils per kilo per minute. And that's where you get this number of 250 mils per minute of oxygen consumption. So, you know, people just sitting there watching TV, they, all their body needs to do is 250 mils per minute of, of oxygen. So, so is that one met or zero met? Sorry. That's one met. That's one one met, is met. Three met. So if the patient has low mets for elective surgery in a stable patient with no active conditions, they can pretty much, and it's low risk surgery, they can go ahead very safely. But as soon as intermediate, if the surgery is like intermediate risk or high risk surgery, then you really have to do the whole thing of investigating stress tests, CPX testing, optimize them, maybe prehab, and then do a risk benefit discussion. Now, this is definitely not the talk where I'm going to go with that. So I've got a whole lecture that this is a lecture I give for the, I'm pretty sure it's for the final exam students. Now, this is a seriously important lecture. If there's any, and I'll, I'll definitely do one of these sessions for this lecture um, uh, in the next year. Um, but this is like the bread and butter of your cardiovascular assessment. Whether you postpone or proceed is, a, is often the toughest decision you'll have. Um, and I've got a system where you can remember that pretty easily. And again, this is massively evidence-based. So if there's any video you watch after we do this lecture uh, or learn, it's that, it's that, um, it's this thing. Okay, who's at risk of aspiration? So now. Essentially, there's a few different categories here. Either you have delayed gastric emptying, you have lost a lower esophage, esophageal sphincter incompetence, or a, and, and a suppression of airway reflexes with the other two. So I want you to just write down maybe three or so in each category. So th there's like there's like a few things. Like this is just one of those things. Once you do anesthetics for a bit, you just get you know as soon as you see these, you you realize oh that's potentially a risk. So unfasted patients. Uh, who've eaten in you know in the previous six hours, like decreased motility drugs like opioids, pregnancy is always a risk, 
disease like diabetes, autonomic neuropathy, bowel obstruction is kind of the obvious one where obviously they're not passing the bowel. So they've got all this gastric fluid there and they've got the nasogastric tube in. Sometimes renal failure, severe renal failure can cause it as well. And trauma because there's a lot of other factors occurring in trauma. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophageal dysfunction things, hiatus hernias, pregnancy decreases that sphincter tone, um, obesity as well, and ascites. So any intra-abdominal pressure difference problems and then suppression of reflex, really. If you've had a general anesthetic, you've suppressed your airway reflexes, therefore you can't protect your airway. So just think, gastric emptying and loss of lower esophageal sphincter incompetence is not a problem if you're awake. It's, but any of these things are only a problem if you've had you know, head injury, neuromuscular disorders, GCS less than eight, or some kind of sensory abnormality there that you can't really detect things. So now the safe fasting time. So this is something that will be just drummed into you guys over and over. As of now, six hours for solids, two hours for clear fluids. And your PEDS rules are four, three, one, and then kind of like the um, adult rules. So a pediatric case, less than six months, four, four hours for formula, three hours for breast milk, and one hour for clear fluids. These are the ANSCA guidelines. They're not necessarily translated into hospital policy, but all anesthetists would know this. And this is what they would kind of be okay with. So PEDS greater than six months, you kind of just go to the adult thing, the adult rules, except for clear fluids, where you still say, you know, they can have clear fluids up to one hour before the surgery. Um, again, really good things to remember because uh, often this will be a checklist that the nurses do before they come to surgery, but obviously just know this information. Now, what I want you to know is what questions to ask for each of these. So this will be one of those things that uh, if someone has reflux, I want you to ask a whole set of questions. If someone has trauma, ask a whole set of questions. So, so frequency, timing with medications and treatment that they have, the presence when faster is obviously worse, reflux all the way to the mouth or the acid, acid breath, brush thing you mentioned, and then is it controlled on the medications? And the extra thing I ask is, do you get it when you're supine? Because if they do, that literally is the way they're going to be under anesthesia. So I'd take that more seriously as well. Now, even though I ask all these questions, I've got to say that a lot of this is just not evidence-based, um, but we'll go through a method for that later. Um, now, for the next person, trauma. I really like the, the way you said extent of injury. If it's a minor trauma, then essentially you can ask all these questions and maybe make a call. Again, non-evidence-based. If it's a large trauma, they're just unfasted. You don't, you don't even worry about asking these questions necessarily. You might want to just to present the information, but often the decision with the major trauma is always that they're unfasted. So there's this kind of concept where you find the time that they had their last meal to when they had the trauma. And if that was like, let's say they had a meal at 12 and their trauma at two o'clock, that's considered unfasted because the trauma stopped the gastric emptying. But let's say they had a meal at 12 and then the incident happened at 6 p.m., then that's six hours of fasting. So people would kind of say, okay, they had, the, they had an empty stomach when they had the trauma. Again, that's no guarantee of anything. It's a really low evidence zone. So I'll show you a plan for that later. Uh, opioids, what do you want to ask about that? I really want to know the quantity, the level of pain control, bowel function. Are they actually hungry? Do they have nausea, vomiting with the opioids as well? Um, and there's a whole bunch of questions you can ask. So that, was, that was really good. Uh, finally, diabetes. So again, if you do a very, compl uh, a very uh, complete diabetic history, you will get an idea of how bad this is. And really for me, I feel like there's a few points of difference. If there's any presence of, you know, presence of autonomic neuropathy or really bad control, then, uh, you know, I'm just all bets are off. I'm really treating this as a, as a aspiration risk, but that's great. Take a detailed history, present to your boss, act conservatively. Pregnancy, everyone's unfasted as soon as they've got a gravid uterus. Um, and so that's just the way I go with that. So a few of these things are absolute, the large traumas and the pregnancy, but then you'll see a lot of uh, decision-making in, in this gray area, which may be you know, contradictory to the last consultant you worked with. And that's completely fine because that's what happens when you've got a bit of an evidence-free zone. So what do you, what you, what do you, what you need to know is that what's most important with aspiration and fasting and what to do is don't worry too much about the result of what your consultant says. You've got to ask those questions to be thorough and present yourself as a very thorough, you know, practitioner, but know that once you make the plan, tr tr you know, really you gather your info, and always act conservatively as a junior and have a low threshold to intubate, mainly because it's probably the safest thing to do 
in quotation marks, but it's also one of those things where you need far more intubations as a junior now. There's less cases happening. You're working less hours. Get as many tubes in just for your own practice if there's a reason to put it in. And don't don't kind of do the thing. Like, like there's, a, there's a thought that the more senior you get, the more you're just happy to use an LMA. And I, I just don't think that's the right way to go. And you could be a good standard for your bosses if you go, hey, look, I reckon this is significant reflux. Let's intubate and let's do a rapid sequence, rapid sequence induction. So yeah, what will you do if there's a risk of aspiration? So really there's just these few things. So you can delay your patient, completely obvious. You can pre-med them. And again, this is not a great evidence zone. So giving met metoclopramide as a prokinetic, you know, may work. Sodium citrate, which is a non-particulate um, antacid. So if you, you know, if they do reflux it, it's not going to go down and destroy the lungs like a magnesium or aluminium type mixture will, will do. Um, it used to be the thing they gave pregnant patients right before they went to theater. But they realized that again, a lot of these things have no evidence and sodium citrate just doesn't taste very good and can in itself cause your patient to feel a bit nauseous. So, you know, it's just one of those things where we think we're doing the right thing, but we're not really sure. So, uh, and Nexium, giving Nexium, it used to be ranitidine, but that, you know, went out of favor, obviously. So giving Nexium with enough time might decrease acidity as well. Again, none of this has been proven to work and the cost benefit of this is gonna be very difficult to ever show, but it's as a junior, it's kind of good to say, look, should we do this? And I remember, I remember thinking this was um, important for me to do. And a lot of consultants were just Im impressed that I was, I, I had a problem, I found a problem in the patient and I was looking to solve it. So practically speaking, you seem to be a problem solver, I think, um, but you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is what's best for the patient. And you're just, you're just giving options to your boss to decide on. Um, and obviously use an ETT versus an LMA and do a rapid sequence induction if you think there's an aspiration risk. So those are really your options during the case. And then you would, you know, like sometimes when you're extubating a patient, you're really kind of waiting, you know, you might find that, oh, you know, it's taking a long time to wake the patient and you just take the tube out a bit early or deep. You would never do that with an aspiration risk. You'd make sure the patient's fully awake, responding to commands and full mus muscular function re returned. You know, we've literally just gone through the standard assessment, previous bad reactions, the family history, PUNV, allergies, exercise tolerance, and aspiration risk. And that's just the next level up. You don't have to memorize it. It's all recorded somewhere. You just need to know how to access that information. And before long, and you know, after you do a couple of years of this, it'll all be in memory. Um, this took me a long, longer time to process because I didn't have the resources and I didn't have kind of this just out, you know, protocolized thing going in my brain until I'd done my final exams. But again, there's not difficult stuff. You just need to know wh what the protocol is and how to access the information. So next, obstetrics and peds. Uh, so again, I'll give you this as a checklist, but this is really just new with ABCs of anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey from medical student to procedural skills from foundations in anesthesia as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.